let's dive into the message this morning. Last week, we began um, looking into a journey of what Solomon, the wisest man on the earth ever lived, um, and would teach us about marriage and family. Solomon was a brilliant man, right? He was one of the most wisest men wisest men in the entire earth. God, he had a dream, a vision. God came to him and said, what do you want? You can have anything in the world that you want. And so Solomon asked for wisdom to lead the country. And God said, not only will I give you wisdom, but I'll bless you in tremendous ways. I'll make you wealthy. I'll make you prosperous. Your land will have peace. And everything was going well for Solomon. He established a great kingdom. He builds a beautiful temple. He had everything the world could offer him. There was nothing lacking in his life. Everything he wanted he had power, pleasure, sex, money, you name it, Solomon had it. He also had 700 wives, 300 mistresses. He ended up marrying women from different nations who served different gods, had different agendas and living for God's glory. This caused him to compromise on a lot of things in life. Close to the end of his life, he came to his senses about his choices and began to advise his children on marriage, on family, on life, on work, on women, on men, on marriage, on children, and a ton of other things. He started giving them advice. And we find those advice in the book of Proverbs. A lot of what he taught, he learned from the wisdom that God had given him. A lot of what he taught, he learned from the experiences of life and the mistakes that he made. So these are incredible words of advice to us from this great man. Last week, we began and we looked at two things that Solomon would say to men and two things that Solomon would say to women. I promised to be an equal gender offender last week, and I had a lot of you guys mad at me at the end of the service last week. I promise to continue that today. I'll give you guys three things that he says to men today and three things for women, and then we'll finish up next week. I reminded you men that you are to be leaders of instruction in the home. It is your responsibility to see your family grow. It is your responsibility to raise your children to follow Jesus. It is your responsibility to be the spiritual head of your wives. I also called you to be men of work ethic. You guys can't be lazy. You can't go to um, those of you who are in school, just simply waste your time and expect you to have everything in order by the time God prepares you for marriage. Those of you who are married, you can't go to work and then come home and sit on the couch and do nothing around the house. God expects you to be leaders of work, work ethic. Your children, your wives look at you and they see that you are people that are willing to sacrifice and make commitments and do things around the house. To you women, I challenged you last week to be models of faithfulness and models of silence and wisdom. Your commitment to your marriage is based on a solemn promise to God, not on how you feel this morning. Some mornings you will feel like you don't want to be with him. But your promise is not, your commitment is not based on how you feel. It's on a promise that you made to God. And the Bible says that God loves a gentle, a woman who is a gentle and a quiet spirit. Not one who's loud, not one who's boisterous, not one who's argumentative. So develop in your life a, a gentle spirit, a kind spirit, a meek spirit. One that's quiet, one that's humble. God says he loves a gentle and a quiet spirited woman. This morning, I want to give you a couple more truths from men and women, and next week we'll conclude. Like I said this last week, this message is applicable for you whether you're married or you're not married or you're praying for a marriage and you're looking for a spouse. You married folks, when I speak, this is not an opportunity for you to nudge your wives or nudge your husbands and say, hey, he's speaking to you. That's not what the point of this message is. If you know this is for your spouse, pray for them. If you know this is for you, repent and confess. You single folks, these are things that you need to do now to prepare for marriage. If I'm speaking to your gender, if I'm talking about the other gender, these are things that you need to be looking for in a person of the opposite sex. This is what God desires in your husband. This is what God desires in the wife that he has for you. So these are the things that you need to be looking for. So guys, let me start with you first because you seem to be a little bit more forgiving. Um, men. You are to be leaders of protection and integrity in the home. Number one, you're supposed to be leaders of protection and integrity in the home. Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. We know this all too well. Our world is not safe for kids. The neglect of protecting and 
protecting the innocent children is what destroyed what otherwise would have been an incredible university in Penn State that we w watched over the summer. It's what tarnished what otherwise would have been um, an icon in Joe Paterno. But he, they were willing, their willful choice to ignore the abuse of children destroyed everything about them. Destroyed the university, destroyed this man's career. Stats tell us that neglect, abuse, molestation, rape of children are everywhere regardless of what culture you're from. These things are everywhere. But God says that the safest place for children is with a man who fears God. The safest place where a child can be is with a man that fears God. Do you see the connection there? In the fear of God, one has strong confidence and his children will have refuge. They need a man who fears God. They need safety, protection from that man of God. Men who fear God use their wisdom, use their masculine strength to create a fortress of protection and provision around their home so that their wives and their children can live freely, can live happily, can enjoy life because they're under his care. Listen, living in our city is hard. Taking kids and trying to raise them for Jesus in 2012 is difficult. In a culture that's infatuated with sex and scantily clad women, even driving around the city looking at billboards, the billboards, television shows, radio songs, even on Disney Channel, is all promoting sex and trying to protect children from these messages that are contrary to the gospel is difficult. It's difficult living on mission in this city, in our culture. I understand when our parents' generation was more concerned about isolating ourselves from the world and fearful about how the world would corrupt us. I understand that. But we're called to push ourselves to the edges, reach people for Jesus, befriend them, invite them to your house. At the same time as you extend a hand of welcome and extend a hand of hospitality, at the same time with the other hand, you're supposed to protect your kids, protect your wife from danger, from harm, what could hurt them. You need to balance both of these things together. In the fear of God, one has confidence and his children have refuge. How are you protecting, guarding, looking after your children? How are you protecting, guarding, looking after the children in our community? How are you protecting, guarding children, the, the, um, the people that are around you in the circles that God has placed you in? You could go the opposite way, right? You could become your own little fortress, your own little enclave, and keep your kids close and never let them out and never let them into the community. You'll never meet your neighbor. You never get involved in outreaches. You never do anything because you want to protect your children, protect your family. But that's not the way we're called to live. Proverbs 20, verse 7. Solomon writes, the, righteous, the righteousness of one who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. What's integrity? Integrity is consistency. It's honesty. It's truthfulness. It's not hypocrisy. Some of you can destroy your family by your hypocrisy. What your wife and kids need from you is your integrity. What, you, what they need more from you than anything else is integrity. The easiest way for me to tell how I'm doing as a dad or a husband comes back to this one question. How am I doing in my walk with God? How am I doing in my own personal relationship with God? How am I doing in my spiritual life with Jesus? If it's going well, regardless of what's going on in my family, they can hop on my back and I can carry them. They can struggle, the kids can struggle, but it's okay because I can carry them and I can pull them through because they look for me, look to me for leadership and encouragement. But if I, as the head of the house, is not doing well spiritually myself, it all begins to fall apart. If I don't take the lead, if I'm not a person of integrity, if I'm not living out what I preach, my family will collapse. What your family needs from you more than anything else is for you to know Jesus, love Jesus, obey Jesus, grow in Jesus, grow in grace, grow in humility. That's what they need from you. This is what is required of you. Some of, some of you need to put your childish ways behind you and repent of your immaturity. Your immaturity because you fail to work at it. You fail to actually grow at loving Jesus. You'll come and you'll worship, but you have no walk with Jesus in your home. When you become married, you can no longer live for yourself. When you become married, you will fall apart. Your marriage will fall apart if you don't die to yourself. The great thing about marriage is actually you have to die to yourself. You've got to become less consumed with yourself. Otherwise, your marriage will not make it. And every child that you add to your marriage, the more you have to die to yourself. Your laziness, your lust, your whininess, your juvenile antics, your foolish spending, all of that needs to stop. 
if you want to have a marriage that brings glory and honor to God. Number two, guys, you are called to be leaders of presence in your home. Leaders of presence. Proverbs 17, 6 is an amazing verse. It says, grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of the children is their fathers. The glory of children is their fathers. What's glory? It's the idea of heaviness, the glory of God, his essence, his greatness, his presence, everything about him. Glory is everything about that person. The best thing for children, what's good for them, what they need the most is what? Is their dads. The best thing for spouses, what they need most, is not that you provide money and make sure the bills are paid, is that you are there for them. You know that too well. A lot of you know that too well on the opposite end. You know what it's like not to have a dad around at all. For some of you, it's because your dad was never in the picture. Others of you, your dad was too busy working to earn an income that he was never present at home to do anything with you. Others of you, your dad was too involved in church and ministry or whatever else, doing God's work that he was never there for family. What a child needs most is a dad. What a family needs most is presence in the house. More than 1.7 million children across the U.S. right now have a parent that's in prison. The number of children with a father in prison grew by 77% from 1991 to 2010 in a span of 20 years. Stats say that those children whose dads are in prison more likely will end up behind bars themselves. 60% of births of women under the age of 25 in the last 10 years are by women that are unmarried. What's that tell me? They're dads that are not sticking around. Their dads are simply impregnating people and then leaving. He's no husband, so there's no commitment. What your children need, what your spouses need, is you in their lives. The LA Times did an article on fatherlessness in society and said that everything circles around to them, speaking of kids, not being with their dads. Kids are messed up, kids are doing stupid things, why? because they have no one to tell them what to do. Guys, it's not enough for you to provide for your children and your spouse. That's a part of it. That's a part of your calling. They need your presence. They need you there. They want you in their lives. They want you to be able to talk to you. They want to be able to get advice from you. They want to be able to share their frustrations with you. That you have to be able to take your daughters out on daddy-daughter dates. You've got to spend time with them. You've got to not just put, sign your kids up for sports. You've got to go and cheer them on and be loud and yell and scream because they want to know that you love them. They want to be there with them. My son loves t-ball, but I've noticed the days that he doesn't do well are the days that I'm not at the game. The days that I'm at the game, he will play well, and then he'll, he'll get a hit. The first thing he does is he'll turn around after he gets to first base and see if, I'd lo- if I saw it. And he'll smile and he'll put his thumb up as if he did a good job. He wants to know that I'm cheering him on, supporting him. Your kids need you in their lives. It's not enough that you just provide the paycheck. It's not enough that the bills are paid. It's not enough that the electricity is on. They want you in their lives. Your spouses don't just simply want you to make sure everything's taken care of. They want to have a shoulder to lean on. They want to have someone to cry on. They want to have someone to talk to. They want to have someone to encourage them. They want someone to be with them. They need you. This speaks to a lot of, lot to the idea of investing in the folks that don't have dads. You guys that have nothing going on on Tuesday nights, whether you're married or not married, instead of sitting on a couch and watching TV, take two hours. Come out here. Invest in these kids. A lot of them don't have dads. But do you know that the impact that we're having on their lives is tremendous? A couple weeks ago, they had the lock-in, and these kids were sharing of the difference that we're making in their lives. Most of our volunteers are women. Guys, come out. It's only two hours. If you can't do anything else for the church, invest in these kids that are looking for godly role models pour into their lives. There's no greater joy that you're going to have than seeing someone make the right decisions and not screw up their lives. Invest in them. Then we who have, then we who have dads who are not around, we have dads who are not around, not involved. Some of you guys have dads, you're dads, but you're not involved. Proverbs 27.8 says this, 
Like a bird that strays from a nest is a man who strays from his home. He's going where he shouldn't be. This is a man who's never at home. He does his job and then he goes out and hangs out with the guys instead of coming home to his wife. He's a father, but he's not around for his children. What they need is your presence. He's there in body, but he's not there in mind. He's either he's worshiping at the feet of money and power, and he's working really, really hard, crazy hours because he wants the success, the wealth, and the toys, or he's just out, hanging out with the boys, worshiping at the feet of pleasure. Let me say this. If you're working hard, providing for your family, being there for your kids, living your life on mission, let me be honest with you. You're not going to have a lot of free time. And at the end of the day, it's not going to matter. At the end of the life, at the end of your life, you're not going to regret it. You won't be at the end of your life saying, man, I wished I got to see that television show. When you're lying on your deathbed, you're not going to say, man, I wished I saw that movie. You're not going to say, man, I wish I went to five more baseball games. Most people that are lying on their deathbeds would say, man, I wish I had a little bit more time with my children. Man, I wish I had a little bit more time with my spouse. All of this wealth I accumulated, all of this stuff I gained, all of these things I've done are meaningless because I can't take that with me. But look at these people that are right by my side till the very end. I wished I invested in them. Get perspective. You single guys, get perspective now. It's good to get an education and get a great job. That's not what life is about. God's called you for relationships. God's called you for connecting with people. If you're not building lasting relationships now, you're not going to build lasting relationships after you get married. Your life now is reflective of what your life is going to be after you get married. Number three, guys, you're to be leaders of thankfulness and praise. You're to be leaders of thankfulness and praise. Proverbs 18, 22. All you married guys, this should be your verse. He who finds a good wife, he who finds a wife, finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 19, 14. House and wealth are inherited for fa from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Guys, let's be honest. Have you looked in the mirror lately? You married folks, have you looked in the mirror? Shake your head and go, I can't believe she married me. Be honest. I can't believe she was willing to marry me. You should be shocked at that. You should be shocked that your spouse is with you. If you are so full of yourself and think that you deserve better, then you need to repent. Look at yourself and let it shock you. If you had to do it again, and she's already seen all of your flaws now that she lives with you, she probably wouldn't say yes the second time. But she did, and she made a commitment to stick with you for the rest of her life. She's been given to you by Jesus. You probably thought you chose her. You probably thought up that you came up with this master plan to win her over and get her to say, I do. But the reality is the whole thing is fixed. God in his sovereignty brought her to you. And you could have made the most stupidest comments. You could have been super cheesy. And she would have said yes anyway because it was God's plan and purpose for you to get married. God brought her to you. God gave her to you as a gift. Let me ask you, how thankful are you? When was the last time you thanked God for your wife? When was the last time you thanked God for your children? When was the last time you were thank, said thank you to your wife? Is there a culture of thankfulness in your marriage? Is there a culture of thankfulness in your home? Is it a thankful home or is it filled with complaining, bickering, arguing, where everyone hates each other? Guys, you were to lead that. You are to be examples of thanks, thankfulness at home. You're the ones who are called to lead in your home. Don't walk around the house and act like everyone in the house should be grateful that you're there, that you should be put on a pedestal because you provide the income, you provide the stability in your home. You have a lot to be thankful yourself. And until you begin to live a lifestyle of thankfulness, don't expect anyone else in the home to do it either. Proverbs 12, 18. There's one whose rash words are like sore thirst, thrusts. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Some of you, let's be honest. When you get angry, your tongue is out of control. You say things that you later regret and you can't take back. 
You have no control over what you're saying, and all you do is attack, cut, hurt, and verbally abuse the people that God has graciously blessed you in your lives. And you just need to shut it. You need to repent, you need to confess, and if you need to get help, you need to get help. Your speech, your words, or your lack thereof is very powerful. In 1 Peter, Peter says, your bride is the weaker vessel. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that she's, she's not talking about strength here. The weaker vessel. It's the idea of a precious vase. Very precious. Very delicate. The idea is to take care of her. She is not a trash can that you fill with trash or whatever junk comes out of your mouth. She's a precious vessel. Some of you treat your spouse like a trash can. All you do is be negative to them, complain to them, complain about them, and all you do is fill them with junk. You fill their lives with nothing but junk and trash that comes out of your mouth. And that's not what the Bible calls you to be. She used to be treated as the most precious gift from God to you. She used to be praised by you. I love how the writer of Proverbs 31 says, talks about his wife. He says, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her and says, many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. He's not making that up. He's not pulling that out of his rear end. He means what he says there. He is sincere. Listen, I'm blessed. You surpass all the other women. Why should I even have to look around? You are so good, so loving. I am so grateful to God for you. Are you filling your house with culture of thanks, thankfulness? You single guys, you single ladies, are you thankful for the women that God has placed in your life? You single guys, are you expressing gratitude for them now? Or do you see them as the lower sex or something else? What's your attitude toward women? You single ladies, if a guy can't be nice to you now, he's not going to be nice to you later. Don't expect to change him after you get married. It's not going to happen. All right, ladies, let me turn to challenge you a little bit. I'll be a little bit nicer to you than the men, but give me, let me give you three things. Number one, you are to be models of honor. Models of honor. The wife is to be honorable and respected by others. Ladies, you want to have a good reputation with other ladies and with other people in the community, contrary to the junk that's being shown on reality TV. All of the reality shows the women hate each other. They're complaining, bickering, fighting with each other. They hate hate each other and will do whatever they can do to get whatever they want. They don't care about anyone else but themselves and their needs and their wants. Proverbs 12.4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. You have the power to either be a treasure to your husband or be like some kind of bacteria or cancer that destroys his bones, destroys his life. How are you honoring your husband? What do you say about them when they're not around? What do you say about them when you guys get together with other ladies and you're hanging out and all these other ladies are pointing out the flaws of their husbands of how he doesn't do anything around the house, how he doesn't take care of the kids, and they're talking negative. What do you do? What do you say about your husband? What kind of image do you portray about your husband? Are you one that honors your husband, honors his name, his image, his character, his identity? Do you speak well of him? I know sometimes it's hard to speak of your husbands in a good manner when they're foolish as they are, and we are, but you need to be respectful of them. What do your friends know of your husbands? What do you you let them know of him? Do you think highly of your husband? Because your friends are going to think whatever you think of him. Be models of honor. Don't pull your husband down in front of other people. Don't pull down other people just so you can look good. God is the one that blessed you with him. God is the one that provided you with a husband. And just like I said, a guy is lucky to have you, same thing goes for you. It is God's grace that you have a husband that committed the rest of his life to you. It's not because you were the best. It was God's grace and love and mercy to you. Honor him with your words. Honor him with your life. Secondly, be a model of legacy. You should be a woman that fears God and is concerned about building a legacy in the home. That should be your concern. Proverbs 14, 
The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Proverbs 31.30 Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but one who fears God is to be praised. The wife, the mom, the woman who invests heavily in the home, it's not encouraged in our culture, right? That's not what's praised. Your models are the Real Housewives or whatever city it's being shown now. In our culture, moms really don't want their kids around. A lot of them don't. Kids get in the way of what they want to build in terms of their own legacy. Instead of a legacy of the gospel, instead of a legacy of Jesus, instead of a legacy of a home that loves and follows Jesus, we pursue a legacy where it's all about me, myself, and I. Instead of investing in a legacy that lasts when you are dead and gone, you're more invested in, invest, in spending and investing in your own life and things that will never go with you when you die. The most valuable thing that you can invest in now is your family. I said the same thing to men earlier, but it applies to you as well. Your children, the next generation, the children in our community, the children that God has blessed us with, brings much more reward and investment than any career you pursue, any ladder you climb, any fame you accumulate. The most valuable thing that you can leave behind is not the things you accomplish, not the things that you have. None of those things will ever be taken with you. None of your accolades, none of your wealth. No one is going to remember you for the things that you've accomplished in your career. It will eventually fade. Everyone's does. But the legacy and the impact that you have on the people around you, your husband, your children, your community, those are the greatest worth that you could ever leave. I know where we live in a culture where we're taught to be busy and everyone works. But what your kids will remember as they grow up is that mom was there in the evening. Mom cooked great homemade meals and we sat around and talked as a family. We ate with our parents. Mom kissed the boo-boos and took care of them when they were hurt. Mom took them to practice. Mom helped them with homework. Mom shared a shoulder for them to cry on. Mom advised them about boys and girls. Mom was present in their lives. Listen, presence is not just for the dads. Dads, it's important. But the mom needs to be there as well. In Solomon's culture, it was easy for men to be missing from the home because of work and career, and the women were always home. In our culture, it's not a stretch to say that it's easy for both parents to be missing often. Throughout Scripture, the concern of godly women is not what kind of job you could qualify for, not what kind of benefits you get, not the accolades of your job. You don't find them pleading with God to make them prophets or priests or kings or queens. You don't ever find any women pleading with God for that. But you see over and over in Scripture of women pleading with God, God, would you bless me with children? Would you provide me with children? Think about Hannah. Think about other women who are earnestly seeking God's face so that they could leave a legacy that goes on beyond them. That was where their honor was. That was, where their, um, that was where all their investment was. Leave a legacy. If you don't have children, leave a legacy in the children that God surrounds you with. Bless them. Encourage them. They will look to you as spiritual dads, spiritual moms. Leave a legacy on them. Number three, you are to be models of diligence. Models of diligence. The Proverbs 31 woman is a busy woman. And some of you are tired of hearing about the Proverbs 31 woman, but apart from doing nothing, she's to be busy working, managing, managing the home, being hospitable, living on mission, even bringing in income where she can. Salary.com recently came out with a stat and said that the stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home mom, not working anywhere else, just takes care of the kids, should make about $117,000 a year with all of the work that she does, feeding the kids, clean, making the house clean, providing all those things, the hours that she puts in, the places she goes, the things that she does. For a lot of you ladies, you work full time and then you parent full time, you aren't even paid close to what you deserve. You do way more than what you get. You should be highly praised, acknowledged for all that you do for your family, for your church, or even your business or your workplace. You should be. A lot of you women, you hear about Proverbs 30 women and the woman, and that's your expectation, and that's burdensome, but that's heavy. But look at this woman. She works with her hands. She brings food from afar. 
She rises up early. She buys a field. She sells it. She makes money. She's not afraid of snow because her house has clothing for the season because she provides the clothing for her children. She sells her garments. She looks after the welfare of her household. She doesn't look down the way of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband says she is better than, she exceeds everyone else. See, it's clear here the passage encourages a woman to work and earn an income. It's not discouraging that. Her heart and her priority, though, is not her job, is not her income. It's her home. It's her family. It's where God has placed her. See, that's not a popular thing in our culture. There was a study done recently called The Paradox of the Declining Female Happiness. The study says that women are more unhappy today despite 40 years of feminism, of trying to be equal with men. The people who did this study thought the opposite was going to be true. The author thought that women were liberated from their roles as 1950s housewives. One lady put it this way, it's, a, it's as if I had got everything I ever wanted and realized it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Let me encourage you. As much as you want to climb the corporate ladder and be successful and help provide for the needs of your family, don't think that your vocation is more important than your call to be a wife and a mom. There's nothing greater. And I think we take that lightly as a culture, as a society. But there's nothing greater than being a mom who influences her children, who raises her children so that her children leaves a legacy that says, this woman is to be highly praised. These are huge and glorious jobs entrusted to you by God. What children need at the age of 1, 6, 5, 14, 18 is simply amazing. And so is those needs that are calling forth from your creativity, your heart, your mind, personally as these little ones come along into your lives. Invest in them. Let me say this as I close. Let me remind you of this as I did last week and I will in the next coming weeks. I don't want you to walk out of here and say, wow, that's a lot of stuff. There's a lot that's expected of me as a spouse. There's a lot that's expected of me as a woman. There's a lot that's expected of me as a husband. There's a lot that's expected of me as a man, as a woman. I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that you're going to meet someone that meets all of these requirements. You're not. Whether you're single today and you're looking for a spouse or you're already married, your spouse will never meet all of these requirements. He won't. There will be days when he's grouchy and complaining and not thankful, even though he should be. There will be days when he's, she's not diligent. There will be days when words are not full of gratitude. You cannot look to your spouse to be your functional savior, to redeem you or save you from your lack of insignificance, to deliver you from insignificance, to deliver you from lack of respect, to deliver you from loneliness, to deliver you from lack of pleasure, whatever element you want to put in there. No man, no woman can ever rescue you. If you think that you will find someone that will save you from all of these things, you're dead wrong. It will never work. You will either destroy them or you will destroy yourself. You will crush your husband or you crush your wife by putting on them a weight that they cannot bear to be your savior and to redeem you from things that you want to be redeemed from. Or you will crush yourself by trying to be a savior for them. Your spouse your children, your future spouse. None of them is your savior. There is a savior that you need, and his name is Jesus, whether you're a believer or not a believer. He needs to be your significance. His name is Jesus, and he is where your ultimate joy, your ultimate satisfaction, your ultimate companionship is. All of those things are found in him. Jesus is not just our leader, guys. He's just not our model women but he is our redeemer. He is our greatest treasure. Jesus is more attractive. He is of more worth. He is of more joy. He is more precious than any person out there in this world, including your spouse. Why? Because he exchanged his beauty and his glory for horror. He gave up his beauty for ashes. Isaiah 53 says that God had no beauty in him that we would desire him. If there was anyone that was supposed to be beautiful, if there was anyone that we were supposed to admire and look and say, this is incredible, it was Jesus. 
But as he hung on the cross and he was marred and beaten for you, the Bible says that we hid our face from him because he was not pretty to look at. He was ugly. He was disgusting. He was crucified for you, gave up everything to draw you in so that he can make you beautiful. He can make you a child of God. He can make you perfect. He can make you forgiven. He can make you accepted. He can make you loved. He can make you complete. He can be your savior. Everything that you try to find in your job, everything that you try to find in another's person, everything that you try to find in your relationship, you will never satisfy you. But Jesus says, look in me, you will be truly satisfied. You will find everything you will be looking for. So you have to be overwhelmed with that beauty, with that beauty of him. Overwhelmed with the image of the bloodied Savior hanging on the cross who died for your sin. When that is beautiful to you, when you see that he saved you despite of yourself, here's what happens. Your spouse will then be put in the right position. Your children will be put in the right position. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend will be put in the right position. They won't be a savior for you trying to make your life perfect and easy. Jesus will be your savior, your God, your redeemer, and he will change your life. And then you will be able to love be able to cherish, to be able to care, to be able to submit all of those things to your spouse because Jesus is your ultimate joy, because he is your ultimate satisfaction. And if your spouse fails you, it's okay. And he will fail you, and she will fail you. But if your joy and your hope is in another person, your world will be shattered. But when your hope and your joy is in someone who is willing to give his life for you, to call you his bride, to put on you a new robe, a white robe, that now you come spotless, pure, calls you his bride. His father calls you son. His father calls you daughter, makes you a part of the family, gives you a new name, a new identity, and says, I'm with you. I never leave you. Your husband may fail you, but I won't. Your husband may discourage you, but I won't. He might not always be grateful, but I'm there. I'm encouraging you. I reside inside of you. I'm always with you. See, to focus your eyes, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations on Jesus, we do this every week. We need to be reminded of the work that he's done. And so as we come to the table, we come not because that's part of our worship service and that's simply what we do, But we come because we are reminded every week that everything we are, everything we ever have, everything we ever will be, any change that will ever happen in our life, any difference we will ever make is because of what that table represents. That Jesus was willing to die in our place, take the punishment that we deserve, take the wrath that should have been ours, and then he would call us his bride. He would transform us. He would send God the Holy Spirit to live inside of us so that we can now live the life that he expects of us. And so we come to the table knowing that, God, there's nothing good in me. There's nothing right in me. But everything I am is because of Jesus. This morning as we come to the table, I ask you to examine your heart. Would you examine to see if there's any affections, desires in your life that are not from Jesus? You single ladies, you married women, are there things that the Holy Spirit this morning is convicting you of? You guys, you married men, you single folks, are you living your life in a way that brings glory and honor to Jesus now? You single folks, are you living your life where you are preparing yourself for marriage for when God brings you the right spouse? If not, would you come to the table in an act of repentance and say, Jesus, I'm living for myself, I'm living for my own ambitions, for my own pleasures, my own desires, and I need to repent, and I need to live the life that you're calling me to live, and I come humbly to the table knowing that I cannot do this on my own, but I need your help, I need your grace. So as we examine our hearts, examine our lives this morning, would you examine your own heart and your own life, and then as you are ready, would you come and grab the elements from the table, and then we will come and partake together. So would you pray with me? Father, This morning, we come, we recognize that the expectations that you have for us as men, as women, as husbands, as wives, as fathers, as mothers, is tremendous. 
You're not just simply calling us to be successful, to be wealthy, to have good kids. You're calling us to a completely different way of living, a way that brings glory and honor to Jesus, a way that the world will look and see and say, that's the type of marriage I want. That's the type of relationship I want. That's the type of father I want to be. That's the type of mom I want to be. That's the type of husband. That's the type of wife. So God, this morning, there's a lot of things that we need to repent of. And we humbly come before you. We come to the table saying that we're not there and we'll never get there on our own. So we come saying, God, help. Help us. We are so dependent on you to be the things you've called us to be. Would you transform us this morning? We love you. Let's worship.